some of her power. Well, how she's going about it using IFS techniques and kind of gets a little pushback and, you know, in herself. And it's like, ah, I can't. Pushback. Well. Confrontation. Yeah. Just felt, seemed like she had a lot of the same issues in that talk she had with her therapist that, you know, I have with a lot of the <laughs> ways of trying to. Okay. Integrate. So here's one of her critiques from the CPTSD books from her audiobook. Erasing CPTSD from myself seemed as impossible as swapping out my collarbones. In order to heal, would I really have to throw away everything that made me who I was? I searched the books for an answer to these questions. The books were full of how to not be a person with trauma. They Negative identity. And she's a journalist, so she's able to research the material. And she noticed this deficiency in the healing books. I listed in great detail all of our faults and failings. But to my... See, a lot of blame, a lot of categories, a lot of this is bad, that's bad, that's bad, this is bad, you're fucked up here, you're fucked up here, you're fucked up everywhere. <laughs> question of how to be a person... Solutions were relegated to a mere 10, maybe 30 pages in the back of the book. In There'd the be one happy story about an abused, underdeveloped child getting the right kind of treatment, developing resiliency, and eventually performing at the same level as his peers. It was so often a kid. Kids' brains are more flexible and recover more quickly, the books insisted. Adults? Not so much. Maybe try yoga, the book said. It came to these books in search of hope but they provided so little. There were days when the only hope I could see was that I needn't worry about the pain lasting too long. At least I was going to die soon. <laughs> okay, maybe a little more grim than I thought, but... <laughs> oh, you thought it was grim? No, just that outlook there that lasts a little bit. I don't know. I like the way she... Okay. Would talk this about is a setup. This, this is stuff. one of her most yeah. positive feelings, but it's very sadistic. So that's yeah. a warning. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And for people it's who have up. limited taste for physical violence, this would be very intense. This blows out educated stories of violence. This mm. is much more sadistic. So, or, I don't know if it's it's getting even. So. <laughs> I had faced there. death so many times before that I knew the feeling well. At a certain point, your body gives up on wild animal panic and instead settles into a foreboding calm. You accept the end. You lose hope. This is why cold murderous rage or cold psychopathy is something you need to recognize because that's actual danger. You have hot rage, which is a lot of fury and tantruming and posturing. But you have someone that's cornered and has nothing, no out, has nothing to live for. That's really dangerous. And that's much different feel. And that's sort of illustrated by her here. And then, with hope, go sanity. That's how I found myself in his room in the middle of the night, standing above his bed. I watched him sleep, examined his gaping mouth, his peaceful face. And I heaved the axe up above us in a graceful arc that would end on his balding skull. And I started to scream. His whole body jumped up under the sheets, and he struggled to focus on me, on the axe, on his sorry situation, before he cried out in terror. It shames me to admit that threatening his life felt satisfying. To hold so much power, to feel so much control. He squirmed, and for the first time in forever, I was not yeah. afraid. First time in forever, she didn't feel fear. Who was the he that she was threatening with? Her dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a... <laughs> so some have random been okay person. With someone else, as long as it says dad, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought it's like, you know, some later boyfriend or something. I'm like, ah. Boyfriend, not okay. Kelly. 
Duh. Good stat. <laughs> there you go. But the first time you don't feel afraid because she's exercising her murderous protection rage. And if you're going to take CPTSD classes that are just going to make you, I'm broken here, I'm broken mm. here, the world is dangerous here, the world is dangerous here, all you're thinking about is danger. How's that going to make you feel less afraid? How's that going to heal you? How's that going to get you anywhere? I can see that. So, first time, she feel she didn't feel fear. How do you like it? I said quietly, in that same chilling, deadpan, serial killer tone I knew so well, and it felt delicious in my own mouth. How does it feel to be on the other side of things? To be inches from death? How does it feel when someone wants to kill you? N not good. It's not good. <laughs> His chin was wobbling. So dramatic, I thought. I handled this with more dignity when it had been my turn. I can bring this down on your head at any second. I will crack your fucking skull open. Slam it into you until your brains burst out of your head. Watch your eyeballs roll under the bed. Would you like that? Do you want me to do that? Mm, mm, mm. Do you? No, no. Okay, then let's get one thing straight. You are never going to threaten my life again. Never. Do you understand me? So this is in response to years or multiple instances where she received that. So then in order for the dad to feel what it's like, what the UC was giving her, she had to exert the same energy. Otherwise, there's no empathy. And if you're dealing with someone who's sadistic, who takes pride in sadistic uh, power games, they only respect consequences. They don't speak the language of soft, naive utopia or whatever codependents believe. <laughs> they only respect power. They only respect pain. So, did this work? What happened? Yes. I said, do you understand me? Yes. You will never grab me. You will never touch me. You will never go over the fucking speed limit. You will drive right. You will never use your car to punish me. Do you have any idea what growing up with a constant fear of death has done to me? It has turned me into the fucking monster you see right now. This is happening because you did this to me. Are you ever going to threaten me again? Will you ever? No, no. I promise. I'm sorry. I'm so, so, so sorry. It was wrong. No, you're not. Please, I promise I won't. You fucking better not, I said, and I swung the axe down to my side. I walked out of his room, slammed the door, and wrapped myself around the handle of that axe before falling asleep. My father left a few months later. Hmm, starting heavy. <laughs> That felt good, strangely, for Kelly. Here's an example of some of the abuse that happened before that led to that. So we're doing a reverse <laughs> a Seinfeld type of presentation for her story. My father pulled up alongside us and screamed, Get in or I'll kill you. His voice was savage and distorted, his eyes like ping pong balls in their sockets. Go, my mother whispered, reluctantly setting me in the car. Before I could close the door, he floored it. 65 in a school zone. We're gonna die. We're going to die. I'm gonna kill myself. I'm gonna kill you with me. I can't do this anymore, he said in a voice nothing like his own. A small part of me was irritated by the drama of it, like the voice was something he stole from a movie. Please, Daddy, I wailed. But he screamed at me to shut up, and then swerved into oncoming traffic. A symphony of horns announced my death, but at the last minute, he swerved back and then stomped on the pedals. Left, right left, right, stop, go, until my head dove forward and then slammed back against the seat. I put my hands up rigidly. Maybe if the car flipped, I could push myself off the ceiling, protect my head. But wait, don't they say that babies don't die after they fall from heights because they're relaxed? Should I relax? Should I jump out? Should I scream? Isn't death, too, a problem I can solve? <laughs> 
So that's her dissociating or trying to game plan to escape the terror or prepare for potential risks. Pretty good. We got home safely, but I never forgot that look on his face, that shuddery voice. I was disturbed to see it again after the divorce. My father didn't hit me once after my mother left, but he was a fan of car terrorism. Whenever we fought while driving, he'd start sweating and shaking, breathing heavily until the car windows fogged up. Then he'd blow stoplights, brake so hard my seatbelt choked my breath, careen near the edges of cliffs, all while laughing maniacally. It's time for both of us to die, he'd sing, smiling. I'm going to kill myself because I'm tired of this life. And you're a fucking bitch, so you're coming too. He almost killed us a dozen times. Mm, one more excerpt. What a fucking bitch, I said way too loudly. And people turned to look, but neither of us cared. Did I ever tell you about the time she beat me for an hour with chopsticks because I didn't want to eat the Chinese broccoli in my soup? He sucked his teeth. I wish I'd known. I would have left her a long time ago, he muttered. And I knew that was a lie. lie. Hatred, I learned quickly, was the antidote to sadness. It was the only safe feeling. Hatred does not make you cry at school. It isn't vulnerable. Hatred is efficient. It does not grovel. It is pure power. Hatred is the only antidote for sadness. So there is a tip from Stephanie who... <laughs> If a kid bumped into me in the hallway, I'd body check him back. This one chola girl gave me a dirty look, and I knew she was talking shit about me, so I called her a slut. She spat in my hair. So I crept up behind her as she stood at the edge of a hill and tried to whack her so hard with my tennis racket that she'd roll down it. I failed, luckily. Pretty soon, the kids at school were frightened of me. Rumors followed me everywhere. People said I was a drug dealer, an addict, a witch who sacrificed chickens in her backyard. A whore who'd slept with everyone at school. None of it was true. But who cares about truth in high school? Instead of trying to convince everyone I was normal, I leaned into my freakishness. Doubled down on my fury. Hatred was the antidote to sadness. It was the only safe feeling. The only safe feeling. So was it? Last meeting, we talked about guilt, right? What's under guilt? Murderous rage. Sadistic pleasure. Hatred. And then what's under that is the core pain and the attachment wounds. So... The guilt is, or anxiety is on top, so guilt is a response to anxiety, and then underneath the guilt is sadistic hatred, rage, and underneath that is the pure pain. Uh, and then you can get to the wound, so if I ask TDP in order to get past anxiety, you have to get to the guilt, then the murderous rage is masked as resistance. The sadistic drive is masked as compliance and defiance. And that's one of the big stumbling blocks of therapy. Because it ends up being a, a game with the therapist of playing with will and posturing of just being at dancing at the edges of murderous rage and just playing these passive aggressive games of Compliance and defiance and triangulation projections, all this other stuff. Feeding off each other. But it's a bit tr tricky to present. But let's see. Because the essence is this sort of this. If you don't pressure somebody for to be accountable for the truth. If you don't pressure somebody or push them towards healing their trauma and pain, being honest, growing up, then their rage and guilt's going to take over. 
the guilt is what Stephanie Wu talked about. Uh, Stephanie Fu talked about all the CPTSD books describe what's wrong with you. <laughs> They'll give you infinite things to be guilty about. <laughs> They'll isolate every single effect and say, for this problem, do that. And for this problem, do that. And for this feeling, do that. So they'll hang out in isolation, intellectualization. Then they'll give you all these fixes to give you the guilt. And that gets you away from your murderous rage, betrayal wound. <laughs> That's essentially the rage. That's why betrayal is hard to heal from. You feel the person betrayed you or the world betrayed you. It's unfair. You want justice. When you want justice, you want to be a vigilante. You have a vengeance drive <laughs> that you don't know where to direct. That's your murderous rage. Forgiveness and surrender, hitting rock bottom would get you to the trauma pain, but people usually have to go through tons of addictions before they <laughs> hit rock bottom. That's the downside of <laughs> waiting for rock bottom. So if you don't want to go rock bottom, then you need pressure, collective pressure to contain the rage and the guilt to get to the pure pain, to get to your wound. This is where ISTDP, their technique, I think, would work against narcissists and codependents because if you deal with your toxic superego, your infected superego, then now the narcissist can't manipulate you. But you have to stop fooling yourself with your superego. And you have to stop using sadistic torture on your inner child <laughs> to keep yourself in check with sadistic rage. That's a bit trickier to describe. It makes sense in my head, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but Davin Lu talked about it here. I think. Devin Lu refers to compliance and defiance as rooted in the perpetrator of the unconscious, the need to punish the self based on unconscious guilt over unconscious sadism. The so this part right here, the need to punish the self, that's self-hatred. How many codependents have self-hatred and shame, right? <laughs> How do you express your self-hatred through punishing the self? What's the obvious thing? Through unconscious guilt, you guilt trip yourself and you're susceptible to other people's guilt trip. <laughs> I need to do this. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do that? But you need a backup. <laughs> Underneath un unconscious guilt is unconscious sadism. So when the shit hits the fan, your defenses come out. Your sadistic drives, your inner abuser, <laughs> suffocates your inner child, often using the same abuse your parent gave you, your copycat, because that worked on you as a child, so you use the same frequency. But then you feel guilty about <laughs> being sadistic to yourself, so you hide in unconscious guilt. <laughs> but the unconscious sadism gets you to the sadness. <laughs> That gets you to the hurt and pain. So if you don't own your sadistic, malevolent side, you don't own your desire for revenge, you don't own your need for fairness, you can't repair your moral injury. That was from a couple weeks ago, right? You can't rebuild your sense of justice. You can't defend yourself without having an integrated dark side, without integrating your sadistic so your sadistic drive is just your sense of fairness. <laughs> it's your sense of justice. And when you have justice, you can say, anything goes if this rule is broken. I can use pure sadistic energy and force it and punish someone else because anything goes. This moral injury, never again. I have vowed to the world I will never again see this happen again. So I will use my most vicious wounds, my sadistic drive, to attack anybody else to enforce tone policing, behavior policing, because that's the downside of never again.
because you're obsessed about the injury. That's the downside. <laughs> so if your you if your fixation is on never again, your energy is towards that injury. Your mind is only on the frequency of your injury. So your never again actually keeps it consciously in the back of your head in your shadows <laughs> to be worried about it happening to prevent it, which is inviting the recreation. You're not living under grace. You're saying grace is fucked up. I'm going to read, write the world's for, rules for the world. Never again this. And it's only based on your one wound, which doesn't understand the larger context of your abuser probably got abused by that. And there's a larger system. You're just invisible. You just got run over because you just were convenient, <laughs> which is depressing, which is why you need to go to your sadism to get to your sadness so you can heal and you're done. But, no one wants to do that. <laughs> Two biggest costs. Loss of autonomy, including difficulties knowing what one wants, and isolation. The person who is reactively and defensively compelled to either give or deny others what they want gives up her autonomy. Her life is not in her own hands. So the loss of autonomy is you don't have a positive identity. Your identity is just trying to avoid pain, trying to avoid the never again. So you have no positive aim. And if you don't feel your negative feelings are positive feelings, especially your negative feelings, they aren't telling you where you should move, evoke motion. Your unprocessed emotions are saying, this is fucking important, go this way. <laughs> if you don't feel your unprocessed emotions, you have no autonomy. You have no ability to make a decision to go forward. Your going forward is based on some past wound, and you'll just be obsessed by that the rest of your life. And she is also alone with her true feelings, thoughts, and priorities. And the isolation part is the abandonment terror. The loneliness that codependents and abuse survivors and cluster Ds all have because... Emotions are scary or set a boundary and leave. It's always blocking and separation. On top of these major downsides are whatever other symptoms go along with the repression of their true feelings. When the patient is compliant or defiant and they have not declared their own genuine will towards a therapeutic task, it is critical that when we point out their defenses, that we add something to the effect of, and I'm not telling you not to do this, or that I need you to be different from how you are. So this is critical, and this is, you know, um, I'm not going to order you around, is essentially saying I'm not going to guilt trip you to, to do something. I'm not going to try to convince you. I want 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 to convince Why does I want to convince you create a trap? Because then you can show your power and your will, your counter will, by just defying me. And then if you comply and it doesn't work, then you can blame me who convinced you <laughs> for how it fucked up another way of defying. So now, if I convince you I've taken your will, I've taken your responsibility for how it's going to work out of your hands, and you can just dabble. And if it doesn't work, then you can blame the other person. Or if you don't like the other person or you don't like stuff, you can just say, I'm defiant. I'm, I feel powerful because I defied you. So that's the sadistic drive. This murderous rage that's getting acted out. This is codependence power. You're wasting in these willpower games of posturing. Instead of taking your trauma by the horns and pressuring and pushing and figuring out how to heal, you're acting out sadistic rage of posturing over worthless battles of defiance and compliance using the ISTVP model. So that's it. <laughs> That's the framing for tonight, today. And it's not so perfect because uh, I'm just downloading it and trying to make sense of it. 
So part of a fundamental of ISTDP is the relationship of me with the client or me with you or me with a peer is that my role of being holding space for you is I do not present anything that takes away your will. And not just that, I try to force you to make a decision for yourself. But I don't try to rush you. I can say, this is what we're here for. And then you say, oh, let's just wait. There's tons of time. You don't want to decide. Let's, okay, we're just going to wait and, and when you decide. <laughs> or just hang out in silence until you make a fucking decision. <laughs> That's the hard part of that silence uh, that they use. These patients will, however, often unconsciously, pull for the therapist to fill the vacuum of their passive compliance so that they can go along superficially, but in actuality defy the therapist to perpetuate emotional distancing and self-sabotage. We undo these projections and projective identification processes by not compensating for the patient's passivity by becoming active and not giving the patient anything to defy or comply with. The so you don't give the other person something to comply or defy with. That's sort of neutralizing the rage charge. So the rage needs something to defy against. Or if you can comply and it fails, then the rage can blame the person that you complied for. So it's a win-win for rage. <laughs> I will just stall and wait for you to decide. If you decide, I'll comply. And if you fuck up, I can rage at you. <laughs> and if you decide something that I don't like, I will defy it and internally have resentment and rage at you. So. My rage gets a double win as long as you make a move, take away my agency. <laughs> I will judge you maliciously with my rage. My sadistic drive comes out sideways and it doesn't look like I'm mean. <laughs> Codependent passive aggression. <laughs> or, yeah, narcissism. Just passive rage, yeah, sadistic drive. Pretty cool. only appropriate form of pressure with patients like this is the pressure that comes from not giving the patients anything to comply with or defy. I really so there's the answer for the right type of pressure, the only type of pressure. And you have this weird sea storm metaphor. <laughs> So you got to weather the storm of pressuring to get the answer they want. And you got to not give them anything to comply or defy against. The only appropriate form of pressure with patients like this is the pressure that comes from not giving the patients anything to comply with or defy. I really do want you to get better, but those are mine. And if you decide to do something else, I'll be sad or maybe frustrated, but I can live with that. It's not your job to take care of me. We're here for your hopes and what you envision for yourself, not what I want. At this point, it's not clear what you want for yourself. Maybe we will get that clarity. Maybe we won't. Take all the time you need. I'm here if you decide you want to talk. And I'm here if you decide you don't want to talk. Right here, you have to use time and space to just give people space to decide on their own. Now you can pressure them by keep reminding them, what are we here for? What's the goal? Do you understand? Where do you want to start? This is your life. You need to take the lead, right? And then you let them work. But, well, this is partially manipulation because this person is going to this person for therapy. So the therapist has some job. So if the job is just to fool you, that's not part of the contract. As at least for this therapy. For other therapies, maybe we can just be friends and just circle jerk forever. <laughs> so there needs to be some pressure. But if the other person making the decision 
Now, theoretically, it could be used manipulatively where the therapist tries to play compliance and defiance to mess with the patient. That's possible. So every model can be used sadistically, sure. When the patient projects their superego and resistance onto the therapist, it can be helpful to say, so this is one of those moments when you see me as a negative force in your life. That's how you see me at this moment in time. However, we mitigate the patient's projections of their will and superego, where they see us as demanding figures, is the way to go with compliance. Saying to a protesting child, it's time for bed, and we're now turning off the TV and get... Okay, here's an example. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's sort of exaggerated. <laughs> but it paints an example of giving space for the child versus uh, overpowering the child, assaulting the child. So the, the giving space is a bit unusual, but it makes a big, makes a good contrast. <laughs> Getting ready for bed, but you're allowed to hate every minute of it. And if you want, when you have finished brushing your teeth, we can talk about how badly you probably want me to get hit by a train. <laughs> There's a world apart from saying to the same child, Quit crying, or I will give you something to cry about. The first That'd approach the validates feelings while still being firm on structure and behavioral expectations. And the second approach demeans, devalues, and cheats the child out of the safety and respect they deserve and need to properly thrive. For people who experience more of the second approach and less of the validating approach, there is a wounding in their will, in the sense of being an autonomous agent. So the wounding of the will could be dehumanization, but it also could be sadistic energy dumped to the child that's unfairly dumped. So if you just look at it as musical chairs, if you can try to theorize, take out the personality. If you get dumped with a lot of unfair sadistic energy, then you have a sense of justice and unfairness that this is not my sadistic energy. So you want to transfer it on to somebody else. Ideally, you want to transfer it back to the person that abused you, but they're dead or you're not with them. So you look for anybody that reminds you of them <laughs> or triggers your wound and then bam, you feel the sadistic drive and you just want to dump it onto the next person. Musical chairs, hot potato. But if you want to intellectualize it, then you can dive into guilt and isolation of affect and, and create a bunch of categories and a bunch of things to fix to avoid your natural drive, <laughs> which is just to dump the sadistic pain you unfairly got from your parent or abuser and just dump it to somebody else. That's the most natural instinct. Unless you rebuild your morality and put it in hands, God's or put it in God's hands or someone else's hands. But if you're taking justice in your hands and you think you were unfairly punished with sadistic torture, if you hold on onto that resentment, the price is that you have a murderous rage impulse in your inner child that will want to get even and dump that sadistic energy onto somebody else. Transference. And then if you can't do it directly, you want to do it slowly and more acceptably like a good codependent, you can bleed it sideways all over the place through compliance and defiance. It's more socially acceptable. It's kind of boring. I'd recommend the more blasts that's more meme worthy, but people are scared by that. <laughs> there is a difference then between complying with parental and societal expectations because it's in our best interest to do so and reactive compulsive compliance that blindly goes along with others, regardless of what is in our best interests. So if you use superego injunctions on yourself to force yourself to comply against your natural instincts, to guilt trip yourself to do the right thing, even though it's against your 
murderous rage and your natural inklings. That's creating a giant hole for the narcissist and other people to do the same energy of compliance on you and you'll follow. If you want to beat yourself into submission by guilt tripping yourself with top down injunctions from a vicious superego, you can get yourself in shape, yes. But when you meet another narcissist who has a stronger superego, they'll use the same access hole to fuck you up. Because the downside is you've lost your autonomy. I don't have that link. Because if you have a negative identity, you're only you're only responding to avoiding pain. You're not going towards anything. There's no positive goal. There's no agency. There's no direction. If you divorce yourself from your core pain, you don't know what matters. That's why we say mad baby. Mad baby gets you close to what matters. I matter. Your pain tells you what matters, what's most important. If you divorce yourself from your rage, <laughs> you can't access what matters. So then you access what doesn't matter, but that's not so good. So you access, how do I not die? I guess <laughs> you access your fears and you just run away from your fears the rest of your life. And it's, you go in circles and that's kind of fun, but maybe you can make the roller coaster circles and it's more fun. And you get other people in the group to go in circles and you have like this do -si do So you're having this dance of looping circles. So then you're not so alone doing your never again identity. That's probably too mean. <laughs> Blindly goes along with others, regardless of what is in our best interests. The defining feature that make them defensive is that they push away our true emotions and they compel us to give people what we think they want or deny people what we think they want. And our behavior is not guided by what is in our best interest. So if you can't exert power to push and pressure the world to get your goals or your wants and needs and desires, you will exert pressure indirectly by letting other people make decisions and then you comply or deny. Because you don't want to stick your head out. You want to have somebody to blame, to rage against. That's where you comply. Or you can drag your feet and you can defy and say, that's not it, that's not it, not good enough, and you let them do all the work. And then you laugh at them that they're doing all the work for you. So that's it this inner sadistic drive that codependents don't fully own. <laughs> That's where you should just own it. Own your sadistic drive and now you'll have, you'll be more connected to your core pain <laughs> so you can direct your life. But back to the uh, super ego angle, if you Choose the path of top-down superego for you to get yourself to comply. You're going to go against a narcissist superego, which is like this. And this is how they treat their inner child. Your superego is like incredibly, just incredibly strong. We've tried this before. We tried being vulnerable. We tried exposing ourselves to the world and we were hurt. We're not going to let that happen again. So the narcissistic part kicks in, takes over. We're not going to let that happen again. I feel like I was born at eight years old. Like I don't have any memories before I was eight years old. And my therapist is like something happened around that time right there where your personality fractured and you developed the narcissistic side that kicks in that has protected you and shielded you for a very, very long time. So I'm eight, nine years old. I'm happy riding a bike or whatever. But in the very bottom left-hand corner of my memory, y'all, Right guess, what was, guess what was in the bottom left-hand corner of my memory, of my eight-year-old memory? Me. The adult version you see right now, me. I was standing there. My the adult version, the manifestation of me, was standing in front of a door where my childhood memories that would not let me get closer to it. The closer I got to it, the angrier I became. We had to stop the therapy. The closer you get to the, the emotions and the, the door, the more murderous rage came out. Even for him, 
That's what he's sitting in. He's sitting in this constant self-sadistic terror <laughs> that says, never again will I be vulnerable. So then he's anything goes now where he can use that same sadistic drive on other people. That's the narcissist trap. Every woman, because was, I was like literally having chill bumps and getting really, getting really, really mad in real life. The closer somebody else gets to that door, the angrier and the more I tend to push them back. So that's why you see a lot of narcissistic people possibly being emotionally un, not vulnerable and pushing people away. The closer you get to them, the further they push you away because they don't want to let you near that door. That door of emotional vulnerability, that, of shame and stuff like that behind that door, of feeling free, whatever. They're so, they don't want to let you in there because who knows what happens when you get in there. You, you know, I started kind of crying a little bit. This is my last therapy session last, last Friday. She was just like, yeah, you are, your super ego is like incredibly, just incredibly strong. When you get close to that vulnerability, when you, when that, when you, you know, when that shame is knocking at the door trying to get out, the narcissist is trying to avoid that shame, y'all. The little inner child us is, is still there, wanting, wanting to get out, wanting to experience the world. That moment of clarity and peace I had in therapy, and I was just like looking, in, you know, looking at my hands and stuff like that, and just realizing it. And I was just, I like, I told my therapist, I love moments like this. She's like, what, what moment is that? I like, I like this clarity and this peace. I like this mental stillness. I, I like this mental stillness. This very fleeting moment of freedom and stillness, accessing the inner child, he had for a tiny moment. Then what happened? Yeah, and then it, it was gone. It's fleeting. Those moments of clarity and peace are fleeting moments. The inner child wants to come out, y'all, but something is guarding it. Your super ego is like incredibly, just incredibly strong. We're not gonna let that happen again. Your super ego is incredibly strong. Not gonna let that happen again. That's never again negative identity path. That's the trap. If you choose a path of healing, which is using guilt, to cover up your rage and try to cookie cutter fix everything by isolating every single thing and mishmashing it together. It's not going to protect you from a narcissist because they have a stronger superego. <laughs> You're using a superego to form you into a certain shape. But if you're forming yourself into a certain shape <laughs> to protect against a narcissist who has a stronger superego that's just pure sadistic rage, overt rage, instead of this compliance defiance disco dance thing, you're going to lose. So then that's why you have to run away all the time, set boundaries, because you can't match their sadistic drive with your inverted disowned sadistic drive. But the way out is reality. So you can use reality against the narcissist and you can use the reality to help you heal because now you're cooperating with reality instead of trying to force a fantasy onto reality. This is sort of the narcissist, narcissistic uh, fundamental hack. Sam Backman. He takes over your mind. So the narcissist becomes your reality test. You, you want to orient yourself in reality, and so you, you refer to the narcissist. He yeah. becomes your reference point. Right. He becomes your, your world. You, mm. And he begins to fulfill your ego boundary functions. Mm. So um, your sense of self-worth becomes critically dependent on him. Your reality testing. All the functions that the ego performs. Mm. So a clue is if someone insults you and you start chasing after them for their approval or to show yourself that proving you're right or proving them wrong, you're deferring to them as your reality tester. That's not to say you shouldn't in entertain other people's perspectives, but if you place too much, or if your behavior shows too much emphasis to convince somebody or to disprove somebody, you're giving your power away in the compliance defiance game where they just, where you just have to ignore, they just have to ignore you or dismiss you and you keep chasing to try to convince them. This is tricky, but if you watch your behavior coldly through film, <laughs> when you're chasing, you're losing because the principle of least interest, <laughs> the person with least, least interest is in, in control of a relationship. So 
So technically, you can do some bait and do some lead, but if you're chasing, generally that's a safe rule that you're losing. And you're losing by giving over the reality testing to the other person. You're giving the other person's approval and judgment higher authority than your own. Because it's triggering a childhood wound where you didn't feel heard, <laughs> and you want to give back the sadistic bullshit you got from your abuser, which is reasonable, but you're doing it with somebody who's in a uh, stand-in. And you're slow, so they're just going to ignore you and keep you chasing and just fuck with you. So Find a weaker person to dump your sadistic stuff onto, I guess. That, that could be the cheap fix. <laughs> And now performed by the narcissist because he had become a part of your ego. He had insinuated you so. And this creates in you a feeling of an external locus of control. Mm. You do begin to feel like a puppet, mm. a, mar a marionette with strings, you know. Mm. You begin to feel hollowed out. You begin to feel you know, that you're mustered somehow. Yeah. From the, from the outside, an external locus of control. And this is the process that we described as in training. So the narcissist becomes your reality test. He yeah. becomes your reference point. So they become your reality test and the second part, reference point. So the narcissist becomes your reality test. He yeah. becomes your reference point. So if you follow your attention, are you obsessing about someone who triggered you or someone you want to get even with? If they become your reference point, then you're giving them power. Because you want them to do something to complete the loop. But if you have the awareness to recognize that you're being triggered from some flashback, is there space to explore your flashback? <laughs> recognize that you're triggered by this person that reminds you of some past thing. Address your wound, address your trigger, so then you don't have to deal with it again. Or address the wound and have space with someone who can help contain the rage so you can get to your trauma, get to your pain. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Get to your trauma. So if you, the trap is to direct the murderous rage at the new trigger. That's what you're fixated on. That's just a wake up call for your wound. If you have the presence of mind to step back or go to therapy or journal or do something to try to talk out your rage to get to the core pain. Stop abandoning yourself by chasing after your triggers, essentially. Now you have time to not abandon yourself. As a child, you're in trauma. you got a dad that's doing car terrorism that you want to use an axe and you want to go get revenge with. There isn't time to work on your trauma, for Stephanie, that example. But now you're an adult if you're away from your abuser. If you get triggered by something or you have a memory that triggers your stuff, if you can have a group, a therapist, a peer, somebody that helps you contain the murderous rage, say it's okay, express it, talk it out, can you get to the trauma? Can you talk out the wound? Then if you talk out the trauma, integrate that inner child, then that button is gone. Or you can choose the other path. You get a murderous rage, you can judge it maliciously, and say, rage is bad, rage is evil, sadism is bad, being malevolent is you know, too evil, too vicious, too entertaining. That's my add-on. <laughs> then you can guilt yourself, <laughs> you can go more away from the pain, <laughs> you can guilt yourself, and then you can break it up into fragments of definitions and words and all this stuff, and, and intellectualize and dissociate. That'll stabilize you, yeah. But it's just a delay game. You're just going to have another trigger in the future. You're just fooling yourself by wasting time, by guilt tripping and just fragmenting stuff and keeping busy or slowing it down. But now you're an adult. If you're not in the trauma now, that means it should be safe enough to address your murderous rage. If it's not, fire your therapist and get someone else that you trust. Or stop trusting a narcissist or wounded healer to contain your rage. Because if you trust that, they're going to quash your rage <laughs> and make you more terrified about your trauma and pain. <laughs> so 
Stephanie had to go through like 50 therapists or something and still, I don't think the one she ended up with was the best. But. <laughs> this is hard. Containing sadistic drive is hard. We judge it. The go-to is to use guilt. So how to address this? Uh, I had a nice visual that we made in person, but I think it's too complicated. But we'll loosely cover. So you have an ego. This is your reality principle. <laughs> then you have your super ego. This is your willpower and morality principle. This is where you control things by making a bunch of rules and guilt tripping yourself like crazy. Okay, so guilt is this layer. <laughs> and underneath this layer is inner child, murderous rage. So that's over at the id, over here. <laughs> and at the id is a hot state. And the rage is sadistic supply. Your rage is your murderous instincts, it's your survival instincts, that's kill or be killed. And if you disown your kill or be killed, as a child, it's reasonable. Because as a child, if you had kill or be killed, you kill uh, your housing, you kill your food, then you also get killed. So you have to stop yourself from killing your parents or whoever is abusing you. <laughs> disown your sadistic drive to get even. So that your other resources are intact. But now you're not a child anymore, so you don't have to disown your sadistic drive. But if you moralize your parent or abuser sadistic drive, now you sort of disown your dis sadistic drive, and it just comes out sideways. And your sadistic drive and your kill or be killed is navigating gain versus pain. But if you have a never again identity, that's turn. Pain is more important than gain. And if you're avoiding pain and you're avoiding never again, that gives you permission to cause pain onto other people. <laughs> Anybody who's a trigger that reminds you of never again you're allowed to use sadistic energy to enforce or dump onto them or take joy in providing sadistic energy because you're avoiding pain. Your energy and your focus, your attention is on pain. It is not on gain. It is not on win-win. It's not on cooperation. If your mindset is pain, there's not enough space. If your mindset is on gain, you can have space for pain. Because they say no pain, no gain. So if you're willing to take workout pain to get gain, your body will sacrifice short-term pain for long-term gain. We have the capacity to have a long-term goal of gain, which raises our capacity to endure pain. Because it has a purpose. But if your mindset is never again pain, that shrinks your capacity to hold pain. Which means other people that are introducing this sort of pain, there's no space for them. There's no space for other people's pain when you have a, a pain is greater than gain mindset, a negative identity. So the middle ground is your reality principle, your ego. You have to learn how to prioritize what's real over fantasies and lies, shared fantasy, deceiving myself or denial and doubt, intellectualizing bullshit. I don't like that definition. I'm going to tweak a word. I'm going to go hang out in this fragment. I'm going to just doubt stuff. I'm not sure yet. Let me go find an author I like that puts it the way I want to. To get a sense of control, to fool myself, so I can fool myself through denial, or I can make up fantasies and lies to create comfort. But both of these strategies are avoiding reality. And what's the most real 
reality, your core pain. <laughs> and your murderous rage is the doorway to get to your core pain, to what's real. Because if it hurts, that tells you what matters. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. The pain makes him wake up. The pain makes him wake up. The pain. And like hurt. Sometimes human beings have to just sit in one place and like. I don't want to soothe people. Sometimes I want to agitate people into action. So your pain will agitate you into natural action. Your natural action to protect yourself is a clue to where your pain is. This is the doorway to what's real. This is the doorway to what's honest. This is the doorway to heal you, <laughs> to address the wound, the core wound, the, the original issue. But you will be driven to avoid, to take the shortcut of shared fantasy, <laughs> toxic comfort, or you'll take the shortcut of toxic control through denial and doubt. Because you don't have someone role modeling you that eating the pill of reality <laughs> is the long-term easier path. And if you eat the pill of reality, you're threatening other people's fantasy. So you're going to get a lot of flack from other people's sadistic drives if you own reality too much. This is where if you really own trauma, you don't have people cheering you. You have people violently rejecting you, suffocating you, freaking you out because... I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. don't know. Because if your trauma is real trauma, it's going to flood people with their uh, frequency of raw trauma, pre-verbal pain. And they're going to feel uncomfortable because they don't know how to soothe you because it's beyond verbal. And it's going to trigger their trauma. So they're going to have a natural inkling to either abandon you or say, fuck you. If everyone's cheering around the trauma, that's a sanitized trauma and it's not the core pain, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Because <laughs> genuine trauma gets this reaction. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. Oh, didn't repeat. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. Because trauma is a doorway to your soul. Only you care about that. <laughs> it's your gift. <laughs> Other people, they can't. Uh, they don't give a fuck unless they've gone through the other end. If they've been initiated, they might be able to give a fuck and hold space for that. But if they're other children, your trauma is threatening to them. They're not going to give a fuck. In fact, they're going to say, fuck you. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me, and two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me, and two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. I don't know how to. So. Huh. So that's reality over fantasy. What's Act Three? Huh. <laughs> what did we cover? Oh. <laughs> Let's just hurt each other and trigger each other's trauma and just cry pain. Maybe that's the solution. <laughs> okay, let's see.
Maybe some more Lee Hammock since I made this. I forgot if it's useful or not, but maybe it'll link to some sort of Act 3. Narcissists don't trust anyone. They don't trust anyone completely with their feelings or being vulnerable in front of, uh, in front of their own family and friends. I still don't trust people 100%. Oh, so one way out is you have to learn what you can trust. And in order to trust reality, you probably need someone to, to help you contain your rage so you can see reality better. Taking a jump to jump reality yourself when you're traumatized is too much of a jump, probably. Because if you contain trauma by yourself, what you're going to get is you're going to get people that are going to say, fuck you. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. Don't know. So if you own your trauma too much, people are going to gaslight you and say, it doesn't exist. Shut up, disappear. So you're going to feel stigmatized because it's uh, they're treating you like a crazy person. So yeah, you're going to feel stigmatized because you're sharing your trauma too openly. So you need a community, you need a therapist, you need a friend, you need a robot, you need someone that will be able to be an anchor towards reality when you're feeling your traumatic pain, <laughs> when you're exploring your rage to get your core pain. It's very hard to do on your own. So having some mechanism, EMDR therapy, something to help you get to the core pain and contain it. You trust that mechanism, and then you can trust reality. But if you go to wounded healers, who you thought you trusted because they share your pain and the guilt, the risk is that if they don't trust anybody, and if they're out to protect from their trauma, if your trauma triggers their trauma, they're going to run over you. And you're going to have to pay which is even more of a great exchange for them. So I recommend people be wounded healers. But that's a side thing. I still don't. I've been in psychotherapy for five years, five years. For the first couple years, I didn't completely trust this person. I was just, just, just sharing bits and pieces. And that's what most narcissistic people do. They share just enough information to get you attached to them, to get you to trust them. They share just enough information about themselves to bond with you, to get you on their side, to trust them. I know how my mind works and I understand what I would do with information given to me. I automatically assume that you are going to do something, do the same thing or something very similar to me. How do I get them to do this? You can't get them to fully trust you. There's not fully a hundred percent trust with anybody in my life. That's just how my mind works, y'all. Now he hasn't reverse engineered his mind, so. If his priority is sadistic rage, power, then that's how to pull his strings. <laughs> Take his paranoia and then amplify leverage of his sadistic fears and then give him a doorway away from the pain or this, the rage and he'll just follow. <laughs> but if you try to create a trusting relationship and all this stuff with empathy and all that other bullshit, he doesn't trust you. <laughs> he just respects sadistic pain because that's how he's managing his inner child. That's their inner circuitry. It's just all transactional. So we've had different metaphors to explain it. But from this metaphor, rage is what's is how he communicates inside with his superego. So if you want to manipulate him or negotiate with him or a narcissist or you have to communicate their language sadistic consequences to your rage something that's going to be fears because trust he doesn't have it my guards are up they just are they always are because this is self-defense mechanism i don't want I to allow people sure. to hurt me when i, I first meet somebody sure. i'm automatically I've... thinking of how i can defend myself against that person narcissists they just don't trust people they'll never like they will never trust you 100 percent. where on the other side of things you probably trust them you told them in your whole life story early on in a relationship you don't fully trust anybody i'll be y'all too trusting i'm just telling you and this is not this is not disparaging towards people who are too trusted and too empathetic so this is him not connecting to shared reality. 
<laughs> Everyone's out for themselves because he hasn't get to share humanity in reality. <laughs> so the long-term healthy goal I'll advocate is reality and getting to shared reality or shared humanity, shared pain. So if you use shared humanity as something you trust, that everyone's human, then you can trust that because if everyone's human, then they all have an id that's motivated by gain and pain that's driven out of insecurity. So if you can find their insecurities from their id, now you know their buttons or you can soften them a little. And they also have a super ego, so they want to think that they're good, even if they're going to lie and bullshit. So you got these two levers to communicate to the person. But if you choose a path of demonizing them, you're rejecting shared humanity. Then you spend your whole life thinking about red flags. Red flags go off. 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 Red flags Then you have the belief of... You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. Flags go off. Red 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 flags go off. So trusting shared humanity is learning to soften yourself. Or that's why, this is why if you soften yourself by addressing your pain, you get the shared humanity, and your shared humanity is your new shield. Your new shield. That's something you can trust. And that's something that if you keep going to shared humanity, you will bounce back. You will be transformed. You have your new self, your next self. You'll die and be reborn. In a sense, that's the Jesus' uh, rebirth story. Metaphorically, he took his pain died and came back to life because shared humanity allows you to take raw pain and God transforms it. But back to trusting or not trusting. I'm just telling you, limit, limit, your, tr limit your trustworthiness of people because everybody's not like you. Everybody's not a good person. You might not even be a good person. Narcissists don't trust anyone so that's the downside of listening to too many narcissist channels or coaches because they're just going to sow paranoia <laughs> into your head because they they don't trust anybody and they just teach boundaries and red flags and he even owns his paranoia here this little girl. oh beef what's going on man do you think narcissists are more paranoid in general? So with sowing doubt to elicit paranoia work. So I'm paranoid as hell. I think the world is watching me at all times, y'all. I just, it's just kind of crazy how my mind works. I think I'm just massively paranoid. I just like everybody. Now look at this Kate or whatever Stan. Does she look, how's her nervous system? Does she look paranoid and dissociated? Is she grounded or is she also paranoid and freaked out and narcissists are everywhere? This is the common of coaches and whatever is always looking for danger everywhere. Do you want to live your less re rest of your life that way? Am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And I'm a safe. If that's your, if that's the way you want to live, just drink. That's easier. Stop hanging out with narcissists. Just take drugs. <laughs> just eat. Just take a normal addiction. Why do a love addiction? That's all. crazy. So back to the question, would sowing doubt to elicit paranoia work? Just <laughs> watch me, no matter what I'm doing, I'm in the supermarket with a mask on, so like people want to know who I am, they want to come get me. It's funny, though, people do recognize me sometimes, but I think they're recognizing me for, to harm me or something like that, or they're judging me because of what I have on. It's just like, my mind does not shut off. I know my dad's super paranoid, yeah. always like that. So, would sowing doubt to elicit paranoia work? Yep. It, it depends. It's like, don't just be careful with, with intentionally doing that because it could 
elicit a visceral, a visceral, visceral reaction. <laughs> you know what I mean? They could get very, very angry with you and just try to harm you. You know what I mean? So be careful with that. But yeah, paranoia does kick in. I think I think the world is watching because it, it, I, you know that's why I have a lot of insecurities. I think the world is watching. Massively paranoid. I just I have a lot of insecurities. Like everybody's watching me, no matter what I'm doing. I'm... I was folding in. 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 I was folding. I was folding in. Folding in. No energy recycled outward. I was folding in. Folding in. No energy recycled. So if you're doing a lot of strategies of guilt and isolating all your affects and folding in, folding in, being neurotic, are you using a therapy or self-help protocol that's written by narcissists? Are you using a narcissistic strategy to heal? And isn't that kind of a mind fuck if you're trying to use a narcissistic strategy to heal from narcissistic abuse? <laughs> and that strategy doesn't work for the narcissist fully. <laughs> and you're using the strategy to protect from a narcissist where it doesn't work for them. And and they have a stronger superego. That's... So how do you heal? Okay, you can cover something. We didn't really dive into ISDEP. We'll address that again. <laughs> and we'll integrate it. I'm doing more role modeling of ISTDP instead of explaining it. You should not lay yourself so open to loss that if you lose, you're dead. It means you've configured your life improperly. So if you're so dependent on one person that you cannot tolerate their loss, then what that means is you have not distributed your support properly along all of the multiple sources of support that you could conceivably have. You can't stand on one leg. Like no legs, you're, you're done. You're in chaos. One leg, that makes you too vulnerable. It's not wise. And so you have to fortify yourself so that not only can you withstand the pressure of tyranny from the pathological systems that you'll end up involved in, but that you can also tolerate the catastrophes of Mother Nature without falling apart and, and disintegrating. Ooh. That wasn't the right one, but good message. Ooh, I don't know. Which one. Okay, let's go with... Your own psychological experiences can be enough to radically disrupt and hurt you, but it can be... So, he uses um, malevolence to describe sadistic drives and murderous rage. Or psychopathical drives. And then he offers a fix from that, or how to navigate through it worked out in the real world too because if you're wandering around naively with your eyes closed and you run into someone who's really psychopathic they'll take you apart and you'll have no defense against it whatsoever because you're too blind and naive and if you encounter someone like that and they leave you in the ashes which they might it's certainly possible that you'll never recover from it you just will not be able to handle the aftermath but also you won't be able to handle the fact that something like that could actually happen so that's the moral injury. You run to somebody that you were warned or you weren't warned about. So a lot of new people they come to narcissist groups and they say, I didn't know these people existed. How could this sort of being exist? How could someone think this way and be so sadistic and all this other stuff? You you just fixated that this couldn't even exist. you you didn't have any sort of sphere. So how do you address that? And that's really the nature of, of trauma. You cannot believe that that could actually happen. And that's an encounter, it's almost always, and this has been the case, certainly be my clinical experience. What traumatizes people is malevolence. It's not tragedy, although tragedy can traumatize people if it's severe enough. But generally, no, people can withstand tragedy. They are done in by real malevolence. And so... So... Real malevolence, I would say, is that 
There's a transference of the rage and sadistic pain onto you, the toxic shame. And then it, instead of the belief system that he's claiming, I couldn't say a metaphor that you don't have containment for somebody else's toxic, sadistic energy. You cannot contain and make sense of the sadistic torture that you receive. And then you cannot share it with other people because if you share it with other people, your trauma and your rage triggers their rage and then they flood you and shut you down. So then you blame yourself. <laughs> Because they blamed you, yeah. But <laughs> it wasn't you. You got the toxic shame and the murderous rage and the malevolence from uh, the real abuser, whoever dumped it onto you. <laughs> you can't contain it. You can't put words to it. So when you try to express it and share it with people, it comes out as pure trauma. <laughs> Nonverbal comes out too intense, too flooding. And when it comes out too intense and flooding, the therapist will say, don't know how to so one you're disturbing me and two you're making me feel incompetent fuck you fuck you don't know how to so one you're disturbing me and two you're making me feel incompetent fuck you so if you have a therapist a friend a group where they want to feel important <laughs> they can't hold space for you because once your trauma floods their containment they're going to say, you're making me feel incompetent. I will blame you. I will flood you. I will attack you because I have better language because <laughs> I'm not as traumatized as you. You have more trauma. You can't put it into words. <laughs> so language wins. This is where actually usually the biggest emotion wins. <laughs> But in social interactions, language wins because we have tone policing and all this other stuff. If you had better language to direct your trauma, then the bigger trauma wins. Or if you're in person and you can separate people and maybe put in a group, usually language wins. Because the mute person has a trauma because the trauma kills their language circuits. <laughs> so you can't express it, so the person with the better language eviscerates you. Do I have that? I don't have verbal evisceration, but BPD mark. Inconsistent <laughs> empathy. Inconsistent empathy. Inconsistent he could verbally empathy. eviscerate. Inconsistent so his inconsistent empathy, empathy could just eviscerate empathy. you. Inconsistent <laughs> empathy. So language wins in a social interaction, and if you have genuine trauma, it shuts off your language, and then you'll just get run over. So how do you heal? Dan tragedy. They are done in by real malevolence, and so sometimes it's the realization of their own malevolence that does them in. But when that isn't the case, they encounter someone who's out there in the world who's actually operating to hurt them. And so, and if the person is psychopathic enough, and this is actually goes beyond pure psychopathy, because at least the psychopath has the sense to be self-interested. You can go far farther than that, where you're perfectly willing to hurt yourself as long as you hurt the other person at the same time. And that's where you go when you're doing something like conjuring up the idea that you might shoot up a school, because those people always kill themselves at the end. And you might think, well, why don't they just save everyone a lot of trouble and kill themselves at the beginning? Well, that wouldn't exactly be the point, would it? They, what they want to say is, life means nothing to me. Nothing. But nothing. I'm perfectly willing to make as many people as I possibly can suffer before I demonstrate that. And so that's a step past psychopathy. And if you encounter that in someone, it's, or in yourself, that's going to be a deeply unsettling experience. And the idea behind many of these stories is that you cannot figure out what to do about that before you have an encounter like that. And if you think about that properly, that's, that's as horrifying an experience as you can imagine, right? It's precisely that. It's as horrifying an experience as you can imagine. And so partly what you're doing is, at micro levels and at macro levels, where are you not what you could be? And when you realize that, it'll take you apart a little bit and burn you down to your core a little bit. 
So this is the incre incremental process of healing, is you have to expose yourself to rejection and failure and accept the burns. Juliana talked about going on YouTube and getting the trolls attacker, and she felt visceral burns from the attacks and the insults. <laughs> and through repeated exposure, she got to see through those insults to see that they weren't life-threatening. It's a gradual exposure of getting triggered, feeling the burns, staying with the feeling, tempering your murderous rage back, your impulse is just to dump back, and you slowly see through the fantasy. And then allow you to regenerate. And if you do that continually, then everything that you don't need burns away, right? So you got to burn off your childhood nonsense or let reality, the stark um, mirror of reality, burn off your nonsense. Or dive into the fire, let yourself get consumed and whatever doesn't die, that's you. <laughs> All the stuff that feels bad, that's not you and you're going to cry pain and think that's horrible, but that's a shell that needs to be burnt off. That's what your trauma is. Your trauma is the pain to help you die and get reborn, transformed. So let's go back to Sam Vaknin's uh, strategy of how to get healed. And let's see if we can use some ISDDD and other uh, models today to try to simplify it or see, see if we're matching. You need to accept that you're a puppet. You need to accept that you have no agency, no self-efficacy, no autonomy, no independence anymore. Mm. You had been invaded. Yeah. You had been taken over. You need to accept this because everything in you screams the opposite. Yeah. I just got rid of the MF, you know. <laughs> I, I, I showed him yeah. what is, you know, I yeah. dumped his ass. You feel like the narcissist. Narcissistic who elation. This, who is this who is saying all these things? Right. It's a narcissist. I dumped my narcissist. I, yeah. I showed him who is boss. Yeah. That's a narcissist speaking. Right. This is how the narcissist would have framed it. So you have to place a priority on proving it to yourself that you're healed instead of this premature celebration <laughs> of healing. You have to try to stay in searching for reality productive doubt to reason and find evidence. Have I healed? Have I healed under stress? <laughs> when I get triggered in that same environment, have I had less reactions or am I still controlled by emotional flashbacks? Because if you use narcissistic strategies, you're just going to lie to yourself and say, no contact, I'll leave and I'm healed. And I just do this Never again, never again, never again, and somehow it end up at the end. So you have to leave some room for growth. That's how I'll translate his tips. Uh, to accept that you had been taken over, hijacked, uh, and to have the humility to, to realize that you are not agentic, you have zero agency. Yeah. So you could get hijacked. My metaphor was saying that you unfairly receive sadistic pain, toxic shame, and it's in your system and it's not yours. And you recognize it's not yours, so you feel it's unfair. <laughs> you should feel it's unfair. It's not just. <laughs> so your resentment and your rage is to try to yell at reality, yell at the word, world, or dump it back on the abuser or dump it on somebody else because you're not supposed to contain the toxic shame that's not yours. You know this intuitively, innately. But if you share this to a therapist or anyone in a group, they'll say, ah, oh, all you need to do is you need to guilt trip yourself to infinity and buy 10,000 books and watch tons of videos. <laughs> to keep yourself busy the rest of your life healing and circle jerking or something. 
because recognizing that it's not yours and you're helpless, that means you have no agency. <laughs> that means you're not in control. That means uh, we're mortal, and that's terrifying. So people don't like that. So he's saying this sort of same thing. That's extremely difficult. That's the first phase. And then it's easy to identify the narcissist's voice, as I said. There. You, uh, a safe assumption is that your inner critic is a narcissist. Is okay. the, the narcissist. Okay. It's a safe assumption. It's also ego. a rule of thumb. It's yeah. like yeah. a shortcut. Okay. You need to silence the narcissist. Mm. Um, interject. 99% of the time, the active voice will say one of two things. It will evaluate you negatively, one way or another. That's inner critic function. Or it will ask you to do something. Mm. or to behave in a certain way. So it's easy. The active voice will evaluate you negatively, ignore him, and it tells you to do something, don't do it. Mm. Gradually. This is not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but to him, it seems easy. <laughs> so just rejecting your active voice is too big of a step. I would say try to build reality testing. <laughs> so use some productive doubt to talk to yourself and say, what's the evidence? <laughs> what's the purpose? Why should I do it? How will it work? Give me some, make a case. Have a Socratic dialogue with yourself. <laughs> and slowly try to learn to trust reality. Aggressive inquiry. So in a sense, ISTDP is aggressive in inquiry. Where they say, what's your decision? <laughs> Why should you do it? What do you want to do? So it's get forcing the client to articulate his will, to articulate his feelings. So can you question yourself <laughs> to articulate your pain, to articulate your motivation? So you would try to put words to your gain and pain desires, your inner child, angry baby and sad baby tried to articulate that through journaling, complaining, any number of creative expressions. Instead of choosing the path of denying, denying expression is depression and silencing your inner voices. So that's the harder path than just saying don't listen to your inner voice. Cause, uh, he says it's easy, so you can try to do that. Gradually, it will weaken. Gradually, it will weaken. And to let your voice speak. And if your voice cannot speak because it's been disabled for too long, yeah. you need to impose on your voice, superimpose on your voice, a monologue <laughs> of any kind, internal monologue of any kind, yeah. the same way the narcissist did to you in his mind. It's a lot of work. So you can theorize what your real voice is and then monologue on top of your monologue if you have the mind space to do that. Um, <laughs> but if you have the space to ask yourself questions, ask your inner child questions and just wait for answers to come up. And if those answers come out and you speak it and you feel stronger, you have some visceral reaction that this feels right, this feels true. Then that's slowly your inner voice coming up. And if you have a group of witnesses who can say that sounds like bullshit or that sounds real, then you have other people that can help you navigate all your bullshit voices and find your real voice. But if you have a group of people that you can bully and say, this is my story, don't devalue it, that's probably your toxified narcissist voice that's just bullying everybody to try to control everything. Because <laughs> your superego, if it's the same frequency as a narcissist, is going to be a bully. It's not going to want to listen to any other alternative voices. It doesn't want this dissent. So it's just going to flood and monologue and then just cry victim. That's the pattern. And I do recommend to write it down. I'm kidding you not. Or yeah. to, or to yes, record journal. yourself. Record. Or to somehow document the process. Yeah. So that you have constant feedback. Prove yeah. to so yourself that, you that this feedback. is true. Yeah. Don't so just that you take have constant it at face value. It's a wily enemy inside your head. Yes. It shape, shape shifts. Yeah. It masquerades as you mm. or, or people you love. Mm. It's, so it's not easy. You need to pin it down. 
somehow document the process. Pin it down. Somehow document the process. Pin it down. And that's partially what ISTDB is trying to do, is trying to use pressure to pin it down to keep you towards the truth, keep you towards your own agency, to keep you from running away from your feelings, to disarm the guilt, to keep you in the hot spot of anxiety to let you get to the emotions, and try to encourage you and patiently stay with you to express your emotions to go from being silenced to reclaiming your voice. And sometimes you need someone to coax you or listen to your voice because it's hard to do to your, with yourself. Sometimes you need a co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian, co-historian, co-historian. I will perfect to guess lighting me to guess lighting me i will perfect to guess lighting me to guess lighting me i will what you need in a friend is a co-historian 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 what you need in a friend is a co-historian 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 what okay we're at nine so the youtube live stream has already started <laughs> So let's finish this off for now. We can add more later. Uh, where is the news out here? I just wonder where is the healing on this? And I just wonder. Where is the healing on this? And I just wonder, 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 where is the healing on this? It's easy. You just need what you need in a friend is a co-historian. Co-historian. That's where the co healing is. <laughs> what you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 Co